Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with both of the authors of quite an interesting book titled How the Spanish Empire Was Built, a 400-year history published in early 2024 from Reaction, which helps us understand where we start from in 16th century Spain being not exactly a country that is the richest, um, has the biggest population in Europe, is kind of doing the most things. And yet then we get the Spanish Empire, which certainly is pretty big and doing rather a lot and very rich. This book helps us understand how we got from point A to point B, which is really quite helpful to understand. So I'm very pleased to welcome both of the authors, Felipe Fernandez Armesto and Manuel Lucena to the podcast. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for for having us. It's a great treat and privilege. Well, I'm very pleased to have you you both. Um, And I wonder if to start off with, kind of at the starting point, can you each please tell us a little bit about yourselves and most importantly, why you decided to write this book and write it together? Well, there's nothing interesting to say about myself. Why I wanted to write the book was quite interestingly, not for the very I know, engaging and, and rather exciting intellectual reason that you've just put forward, Miranda. You said that uh, it, 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 the, the, the book was interesting because it contributes to our understanding of what turned Spain from a small, marginal, unimportant part of Europe into the world's great superpower and this tremendously productive culture and civilization which generated not only so much conquest and so, so much uh, um, strength, but also so much intellectual and, 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 and artistic greatness in the 16th and 17th centuries. And of course, you're quite right. I mean, that is a you know, fascinating topic. But I think what I was more interested in myself was the problem of empire. How and why do empires happen? What makes them work? And especially pre-industrial empires, and especially an empire like that of Spain, which given the fact, as you quite well put it, that this was a very small and poor country, it does seem amazing that so many people, so many cultures, literally thousands of different cultures in every habitable environment of the time became part of the Spanish polity. And I I wanted to understand how that could happen, especially in a pre-industrial period when Spaniards didn't have the technology or the manpower to force anybody really to do anything. This was empire was a collaborative venture and I wanted to know what made it tick, what made people all over the world, all these different climates and places and cultural contexts, what made them willing to go on being part of this, which first of all become part of that empire in the first place, and then go on being um, willing to do it. Manolo may have a different uh, perspective of his own, but I, I mean, I think one of the things that we, we shared is that, that you know, we, we, we were both under an obligation to um, uh, patron Rafael de Pino, and we, 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 were, we were looking for a, a subject which would do honour to his his memory in a book that we wanted to dedicate to him. And as for why we wrote it together, well, I mean, you know, we're just very old old friends and and collaborators, and because we agree about most things, but also, you know, have, have disagreements, that makes collaboration both possible because of the overlap and both fruitful because of the the differences. And certainly for me, working with Manolo oh, was one of the great pleasures of writing the uh, writing the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll let him know. <laughs> I'm wrong about everything. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Felipe and Miranda. Of course, I'm very honored just to be here. First of all, I must say I was invited uh, uh, because of you uh, in order to take part in this project. I, I'm the second author of the book. I was invited by Felipe and the Fundación del Pino, and well, after a very long time, 
uh, researching about history of science, history of technology in Spain and in Hispanic uh, and Spanish speaking countries. Well, um, the idea of technologies of the South, if I can uh, just express the idea as such. Well, I think this idea of explaining why the Spanish Empire was so successful took such a long time uh, before disappearing at the end of the 19th century, after the, 15th, the 16th century onwards, why it was the first global idea and the, the, the first globalized empire uh, in the history of humanity. Of course, we, we had a lot of, uh, of elements just to think about. On the other hand, um, I think we historians have been very centered in the explanation of why the empires in general, not only pre-industrial empires, but post-industrial empires, including the British Empire. Uh, well, there are a lot of books about the beginning of the empire, the moment of success, the epic of battles, and so on and so forth. And then a lot of books and explanations about the end of the empire. And Felipe, it seems to me nobody is explaining why the empires can last and why the European empires uh, were so successful in comparative perspective, being in such an amount of lands and continents. And well, we, we cannot uh, understand and explain the global world of our times without the imperial experience. It seems to me that's a key point we try to explain, Miranda. Mm, very helpful to understand from the both of you, both the content that drew you to it, as well as obviously the key relationship between both of you. So thank you for starting us off with that background. Um, I wonder if you can maybe take us into these questions of the, the you've both mentioned big picture questions around empire that you were curious about and brought you to this project. Why was the Spanish Empire such a good sort of case study to think about this durability of empire, to think about what makes them strong or weak? Why the Spanish Empire? No, I'll let Manolo go first this time. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think because it, it was the first one in the Renaissance, uh, first of all, it arrived very first with the Portuguese and the Spanish and after the 1580s at the same time, the empire of the Philip II and Philip III and IV. And I think because all well, it's a unique case, because it is impossible to explain anything taking into account determinist elements. We love so much, we historians love so much, well, this uh, approach to what is unexpected uh, we have these people suddenly in a place, well, never in the entire life uh, coming from tradition, they could have the explanation of what was happening in front of them. Well, taking all the time uh, urgent decisions in order to survive. And I think that's that's the reason why the case of, of Spain and the Spanish Empire is so important. On the other hand, um, the great moment of epic in the Spanish Empire is coming roughly in the 16th century. After that, all was about surviving, adapting, being very flexible, in front of, of course, cultures and civilizations of Asia, Africa, and the Americas. And that's a, another period, a very important moment of Creole politics and, I would say, adaptation to local conditions, which, of course, it seems to me, Felipe, is at least one of the, uh, of the explanations we have to explain why it took so long to finish with the Spanish Empire. Yes, I think the only thing I, I'd want to add, I thought that was an admirable um, a, a exposition, but I, I guess I would want to add two things. One is the e enormous environmental diversity of the Spanish Empire. I think if you want to understand empires, you go for, you have to start really by examining the one which is both the most representative and the most extraordinary simultaneously, and that's the Spanish Empire. And I think what makes it representative is pretty, pretty, um, pretty obvious. It's the the first uh, European overseas empires. 
Manolo says the first global empire, say it becomes representative of a kind of imperialism which becomes increasingly important uh, in the modern uh, era and, as Manolo has said, helps to fashion the world in which we live. But I think that what makes the Spanish Empire extraordinary isn't just, you know, what we've already covered, your opening remarks, Miranda, you, you mentioned one of the things that makes it extraordinary, which is the sort of mismatch, the kind of disproportion between the small, poor country from where the empire is founded and the vastness of the polity that results. But for me, the really um, I mean, inescapable, conspicuous peculiarities of the Spanish Empire are its environmental diversity, first of all. I mean, there's no other empire that exists on this scale uh, in the tropics. No other European empire does more than, you know, take little bites out of the tropical world. Um, the Spanish Empire occupies mountains higher than any European had ever seen before. <laughs> and deserts, you know, bigger and more aggressive than any European had ever survived in. Um, it crosses two vast oceans, including, you know, the the Atlantic, which, um, you know, for, for centuries you would have tried to cross the Atlantic and then never, no one ever really succeeded in opening up viable routes to and fro across the, the ocean before the Spaniards did it. And as for the Pacific, you know, I mean, this is just the world's biggest ocean, and as far as we know, nobody had crossed it except Polynesians by island hopping um, ever before, and yet the Spanish Empire, you know, unifies the two shores of both of these, these empires. So just in environmental terms, it's unique. And then if you look at the cultural diversity, I think that's also extraordinary, because, you know, we're talking about people who speak literally thousands of different languages with very contrasting social systems, religion, religious traditions, at least most of them became Catholics under Spanish influence, um, you know, different ways of eating, different ways of organizing life and society and families, and they all come together in this, this uh, um, 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 almost kind of reality-defying um, single polity which embraces more cultural diversity, I think, than had ever been encompassed in a single state uh, in in history. So these are the reasons, I think, for choosing the Spanish Empire. If you want to have the most challenging, the most representative, the, the strangest and the most instructive case in the history of empires worldwide and across time, go for the Spanish Empire. Hmm. It's in fact exactly because of those massive problems and especially the environmental challenges, Felipe, that you just mentioned, um, that I want to start talking about kind of how the empire tries to get over these challenges. Um, because quite literally, there were all sorts of things in the book of a canyon that there was no bridge over and they wanted a bridge. Okay, well, it was, as you said, higher, steeper than anything that previous techniques that they were familiar with could be used for. So how, you know, on a really practical on the ground level, how did Spain get engineers who were able to figure out what to do about these sorts of things? Well, engineers are crucial, um, not only because the process of building the empire is a process of engaging with the environment, and engineering is the, it's the art and science which we humans use to modify hostile environments and turn them into those in which we can live or in which we, we want to live. So the engineers are actually critical. I think they were, their work was also critical in reconciling subject and victim peoples of the empire to the existence of this great cosmopolitan Policy. Because you've got to ask, you know, why did all these people just put up with the Spaniards? Why didn't they just throw the Spaniards out? After all, the Spaniards were never more than tiny minorities wherever they they went. And really they were kind of at the mercy of indigenous people. Uh, but in most places, 
uh, you know, we don't get history as long histories of resistance in the Spanish Empire, get long histories of collaboration. And I think that's because the work of the engineers created infrastructures, created economic possibilities, created trade routes, created new access to new markets, introduced new forms of economic exploitation, which were enriching, at least, you know, for the indigenous elites and for a kind of critical threshold sort of mass of uh, indigenous people who could profit from being part of the Spanish Empire thanks to the work of the engineers. And in those respects, the engineers are absolutely critical. And I I think Manolo and I felt that, uh, although, you know, there have been people who've looked at the uh, history of engineering in the Spanish Empire, they've looked at it in the past mainly from a sort of technical engineering perspective. And we saw the potential of looking at it from a historical perspective and understanding how engineering not just transformed the environment, but also made the empire work, made it function made it viable as the kind of enterprise which all these subject and victim peoples were willing to buy into. I I think for the specific answer to your question, Miranda, about how how they found, how they got engineers to do this this work, I I think I'd better hand over to Manolo since I've had more my share of time on this question already. Well, thank you very much, Felipe. I think Miranda is a fascinating question related to different chapters of the book, the history of trust and cultural interchange. For me, I I have just one single example, which is fascinating for me. On the one hand, how you convince Europeans, not only coming from Spain, but from Italian states, Northern Europe, or any other places, just to use a bridge in the Andes made of vegetal elements with plants. Plants are not to make bridges, <laughs> but uh, that's, of course, the sort of element they had there in, in the forest or in the mountains. And, well, uh, indigenous peoples uh, managed, of course, to show how it was possible to to trust and to cross <laughs> in these huge mountains in the Andes w- without risk. Um, and well, you, you have that that question of how trust was built. On the other hand, there are some fascinating information coming from archives about how the experience of building a bridge was established in the Andes or in in near Spain, in what is now Mexico, and how indigenous people uh, peoples uh, at the moment the bridge was ready to use, uh, just escape because they fear every everything was going to be destroyed because they had the possibility of just well imagine that element, that new element, building up an influence in the space and nature and environment was going to survive. So for me, that's that's very, very much um, at the very center of the uh, uh, of the arguments of the book, how this is a history of trust and interchange and social institutions as well. And I think it's extremely important, Miranda, to take into account how the free blacks or uh, mulattos, artisans uh, were working everywhere, traveling from one place to the other, uh, how very different we, we have this approach to the indigenous world as something unified is completely mistaken. We have very, very different approach to experience of um, encounter with Europeans coming from different places of Europe as well. And I think, I absolutely agree with Felipe, this is the history of the cultural limits and how globalization was something step by step about not the moment of the arrival, of course it is, but what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm going to stay here. Uh, what, what's the business of our future uh, in common and how we need infrastructure yes, to, to imagine what's going to be next? I, I think, don't think we've quite answered the one part of your question, Miranda, which was about the recruitment of engineers. Um, I think in order to understand that, first of all, one's got to 
take into account the scale of the problems because you know this this is a vast empire with enormous environmental challenges and there are just so many bridges and roads and hospitals and prisons and and administrative buildings and schools and and missions and and forts and 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 shipyards there's just so much that needs to be supplied you need engineers to 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 do all of that also the sort of just getting water supplies to the cities all this stuff required a lot of engineering skill and there were never enough professional engineers the spanish monarchy invests quite heavily in engineering education and you know pays quite handsome salaries to engineers who are willing to go out and work on these colonial frontiers but there are never enough and for me i i wonder i hope manolo will agree with me here the really critical difference is supplied by all these extraordinary amateurs you know priests and soldiers mainly you don't often have specific engineering education sometimes some of the priests have you know, a little bit about architecture there but they they um uh, they adapt and they supply uh, the skills that are required and they have the vision and the imagination to design stuff and, and take the tremendous risk of setting about building um, all of these infrastructural elements uh, without necessarily being adequately trained professionally to the for the task and to a great extent the story we tell in the in the book is a story of heroic um, amateurs supplemented of course by these great uh, these great professionals but there are never enough of the latter absolutely Felipe I think uh, there is a trip between these amateur engineers, priests, friars, or, well, maybe artisans or whatever, that just crossing the Atlantic or going to the Pacific and then, well, in, given the circumstances, being obliged <laughs> to imagine cities, um, mines, or shipyards, or any other uh, element of infrastructure. It must be said, after the 18th century, it is we are speaking about the model related to continental Europe, Miranda. There was a new approach very much based in military engineers, Navy officers. Uh, I mean, the, the new Newtonian approach to intervention in, in open territories based, well, in, in the new presence of a state. And that's a, another very different uh, history related to corps of engineers and so on. But I absolutely agree with Felipe, this sort of miracle of people just knowing how to make a, a, a fountain or something very small. And then suddenly in the uh, in, in a measurable scale of what's in the Americas, uh, just, well, after... Having a house, you must imagine what a city is and you are in front of. Uh, and well, one of the titles of the book, Felipe, I think uh, it was your idea, of course, to write this chapter. It's about the importance of the infrastructure of missions in the frontiers of the Spanish Empire. And I think it's very much one of the original arguments, it seems to me, of the book. Don't you think so? Yes, I think that there are, you know, I hope there are lots of original things in the, the book. I think the overall approach is original. Um, uh, I think the, the recognizing that missions are themselves triumphs of engineering, which do all of the things that engineering had to do, but at the, the remotest frontiers of the uh, of the empire, I think that is very important. I also think the chapter on health is quite um, are quite original because people haven't taken uh, into account the, the, in understanding the Spanish Empire the enormous investment in building and manning hospitals um, which this empire engaged in and you know I, I, I don't want to just be a sort of an apologist for empire because empires are in my opinion you know fundamentally and basically uh, evil things. I wouldn't want a lot of other people coming over and telling me how to, how to you know, run my society. But, 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 but one, you know, given the fact that empire, they are a fact of, um, of life, the Spanish empire was a relatively benign empire. And you can measure that, you know, in the, in the contribution that the, 
the Spanish monarchy made its huge investment in all these thousands of of, um, of hospitals. Uh, I think that's a really important part of the of the book, which I hope will open people's eyes to, yes, this quality of, I think, benignity is the right word for it, because, of course, these hospitals only existed, you know, for poor people, for indigenous people, for for black people. If you were rich, you, you would never go to a hospital in the end of one period. You, you'd pay a doctor to come uh, to come and see you. So these were, really were the very remarkable uh, feature uh, that I don't think has been covered in other histories of the Spanish Empire at all. Hmm. I'm glad you highlighted that and added it in, um, because it is a really interesting chapter of the book. I want to ask about another aspect that hasn't we haven't discussed yet, um, but I think is kind of speaks to the points you're already you've been raising about these these feats of engineering, about the practical aspect, about kind of the different people who have to work together to get something done. Um, We often think kind of about the creation of empires being over there and happens in relation with, whether that's violent, coercive or not, indigenous people. But as you both point out in the book, um, first you have to get there. And getting across the Atlantic Ocean is not exactly a small thing. So I wonder if both of you can tell us a bit about kind of the challenges, the processes, the skills, the innovations that are needed to even get across the ocean in the first place. Yeah, well, to get across the ocean in the first place, of course, um, the really, I think the really significant technology, which uh, we don't cover in the book because it, it happens before the Spanish Empire comes into being, is actually a water cask technology. In order to spend a long time at sea, the really big prerequisite, which people had never been able to supply in the past, was sufficient drinking water to keep you going whilst you were out of sight of of land and out of the possibility of recharging your water supplies. So I I think it was, you know, a lot lot of people have written about, you know, ship design and rigging and and, um, uh, navigational tools and so on. I didn't really think any of those were tremendously important in making transatlantic navigation possible for the first Time, you know, possible on a regular basis with a, you know, routes to and fro right across the ocean. That's a new development from Columbus onwards, and I, I think that the water cast technology was the critical one, um, the critical one here. But you know, I think what you the absolutely <laughs> basic thing which makes um, the Spanish Empire possible is the willingness of Spaniards to undertake these terrible journeys. You, 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 know, you rightly say, Miranda, that it was no, no easy task to cross the Atlantic. These ships were like sort of torture chambers. They <laughs> were so sort of uncomfortable. The food was, was revolting. You, you, you were eating all this sort of salt food all the, the time. It, it, all, it went putrid. The, you were, you, you, the water casks made it possible to, to, to carry drinkable water, but it still tended to be, you know, very inferior, especially by the time you, you arrived on the other side of the, the ocean. And if you didn't have an easy passage, if the winds weren't favourable, you know, it could take a Tremendously long time, uh, you know, to, to cut, it, it, on a, you know, with a good following wind, you could do it in a couple of of weeks if you were lucky. But these journeys could take well over a hundred days if the uh, if the winds didn't do their expected job and didn't turn up in the right place at the right time. So, so we're talking about long, grueling, hazardous voyages. People had no means for much of this period until the late 18th century of, of knowing where they were on the ocean in terms of longitude and latitude finding um, technologies were pretty rudimentary. So for most of the time, you literally didn't know where you were. <laughs> and, and, you know, your chances of ending up in the wrong place were quite substantial. And if you, if, 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 and if you, you managed all that and you, and you, you could tolerate the fetid conditions on, uh, on board ship and the, the lack of, of adequate food and, um, 
uh, and drink and 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 if you weren't you know massacred in a in a mutiny when you got that, you, know, you were in this extraordinary defiant environment that was entirely unfamiliar and which, to which you had to adapt so the real to me the really amazing prerequisite is that there were people in Spain who were willing to to do this and and if you compare the Spanish Empire say with the French Empire you know the, the reason why the French Empire on the continent of the New World, never really got a gang. Well, so they couldn't persuade enough French people to go and endure all this misery and suffering. Um, and and although um, um, the, the British Empire was a little bit more successful in recruiting people, the Spanish remains, I think, very... Um, extraordinary in in the success with which it mobilized such little manpower as it had available for this very daunting uh, this very daunting enterprise and of course you know once you got there we, we know about how terrible empire was for the health of indigenous people it was also actually pretty terrible for the the health of the the colonists who also faced uh, you know terrible um, uh, body racking horrors in adjusting to the new environments and coping with uh, the new diet and uh, rarefied atmospheres and weather that they hadn't experienced before. So, in all of these respects, I think it was um, such a challenge that it's extraordinary that it happened at all. And for that, more important, I think, than any technological innovation was willingness on the part of Spaniards to go uh, and um, and play their role. Well, I, I, I think, Miranda, um, after this masterpiece of explanation by Felipe, uh, I would just add a couple of elements. I think how uh, it was possible to make something predictable of the trips, how between, I would say, Felipe, uh, three weeks and three months, <laughs> you, you are going to arrive. Uh, and these people, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of persons were crossing the Atlantic or the Pacific going to Manila and the Philippines, uh, brought almost three centuries. They, in the case of the now the China, the the uh, the route to the Philippines, um, it was one of the longest routes in the trade uh, in the history of humanity. Three centuries of continuous uh, travels going to, from America to Asia and then return to what, what is now Acapulco or any other port in in what was at that time the viceroyalty of New Spain. But, but in the end, it was predictable and they managed to organize these fleets in order to arrive. And I would add another element, Miranda, which is how decentralized the structure of the uh, of, of the fleets wo uh, was uh, organized because well the most important shipyard was in fact Felipe in Havana in Cuba and then in Manila and then in Guayaquil in what is now Ecuador uh, of course there was very important shipyards in Cadiz and in in the north of Spain but I think it was very much uh, adapted to the conditions of uh, materials, technology, knowledge of of these people living in very different maritime cultures around the world, and of course we need some comment coming from you about this question of how. Uh, well, in the end, it was about connecting different maritime and cu maritime cultures throughout the different continents. Don't don't you think so? Yes, I think you make a very good point. Of course, the the rapidity with which. Um, the New World and even places in the Philippines were transformed into cities, environments which uh, Europeans could recognize and feel at home in. That's also you know, a vital part of, uh, of making those, those journeys worth undertaking for the, these sort of heroic or rather sort of adventurous types um, perhaps heroic's not a good word because many of them were desperados who only went to the new world because they couldn't succeed in the competitive, um, socially competitive environment of home. But but in any case, what made it possible for them to do that was the transformation of these these places in 
in remote parts of the world, and again, engineers were critical in effecting those transformations. And, you know, the, 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 the existence of Manolo mentions of all these very productive shipyards uh, in Spanish colonies is a fantastic example that, you know, you could also say the, the, these places often had, you know, uh, um, um, amazingly well-built uh, urban centres with magnificent cathedrals, libraries, universities, and the rapidity with which all this happened is really stunning. And, and I don't know, it still surprises me when I when I think about it, even after all the effort I put into understanding it, I still feel I'm only on the verge of doing so. <laughs> hmm. Very interesting to hear that um, from both of you. So thank you for taking us quite literally uh, on that journey in many ways. And it still surprises me just how unpredictable, Manuel, as you said, the three weeks to three months. I mean, goodness, who would sign up for that? Um, I wonder if I can ask, given that we've in many ways been sort of traveling through the book and through these ideas through kind of different physical constructs, right? I asked about bridges. Felipe, you talked about hospitals. I've just asked about ships and getting across the ocean. Can I ask about fortifications? Um, this is something I was particularly interested in because, of course, the borders of this empire get to be pretty massive. So the idea of having fortifications that can, can kind of defend the border in a way that we might think of today doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And yet there are fortifications that are built and they are serving some kind of purpose. What's going on with the fortifications? Well, do you want to go first, my lord? Uh, well, I, I think uh, it, it was very, very interesting just to think how, on the one hand, it is very much related to the heritage coming in Spanish-American cities um, in Cartagena or Veracruz or Havana or San Juan de Puerto Rico, many other places, Miranda. And it is there and it's very much, well, the Spanish Empire is represented as a part of a uh, cultural heritage recognized by UNESCO or any other important institutions and an element of cultural tourism, which of course is something very important, monuments, something coming from the past in front of you, asking many people, well, about the origins and the past and the power of the past in the present and I'd say in the future. But on the other hand, as, as you have just said, well, it's about the weakness. It's about, well, how it was impossible to defend as such. The Spanish Empire was uh, too big. Uh, it was impossible to defend. Impos it was impossible to pay. And one of the many elements we, we try to analyze in the book was how the important was not the city, or the inhabitants, or the people, but the port, just to have the port connected, was the only possibility to survive in the moment of some, some attack of coming from the ocean. And there was this negotiation between these people coming from, I don't know, Jamaica, or uh, some French island or any other place or in due course even what is now United States and how well they, they were just asking for money uh, in order just to not burn the city like in the times of the Roman Empire. But I think in the end what we have in front of us is the explanation of how limited was the globalization in the early modern period, how how weak was the Spanish Empire at that time? And at the same time, how they managed to survive? And the, the question of how big it was, was one of the explanations of how they managed to survive. And well, I think uh, on the other hand, it was this, this connection very typical of frontiers in a global scale between the most advanced technology and the most advanced engineering Europeans had at that time, people coming from the northern states of Italy, for example, to the Caribbean, Miranda, on the one hand, and in the other, how it was an impossible task to defend the empire with such a scale. What do you think, Felipe? Yes, well, obviously, I agree with all that. I, I, I think it's worth saying that, it, strangely, perhaps, the maritime routes 
that uh, formed the global infrastructure of the empire and linked all these colonies together and linked them to the metropolis. Uh, but that was actually, strangely, easier to defend than the landward frontiers of the empire. Um, because the Spaniards invested a lot in building fortifications and key ports and in a convoy system which made the transoceanic fleets almost invulnerable. In, 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 in Dutch and English school children read stories <laughs> of, of successful piratical raids. But the amazing thing is how few of these there were um, and how rarely um, Spanish fleets were lost to enemy action and how rarely piratical attacks on um, Spanish cities in the empire succeeded. I mean, they, you know, there were very, some very conspicuous um, successes, um, uh, especially, obviously, the British capture of Havana in the Seven Years' years War. That was a, a, a great achievement by the... the um, by the British, but if you compare it with the even greater achievement of the Spaniards in defending most of these places successfully for such a long time, um, I, I do think it's an extraordinary record. The landward side was much harder to defend because it was peopled very often by um, nomadic or semi-nomadic peoples, pastoral peoples um, who had appropriated Spanish weapons and um, and horses, and who constituted very formidable enemies whom it was very difficult to keep track of, um, like the Mapuche in the south uh, of the South American cone. You know, if you 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 go to um, as a museum in, in Santa Rita, which was assembled by the, the, the people who make Santa Rita wine in, in Chile. And it's the most extraordinary museum because it's full of, of all these Mapuche artifacts made out of the silver that they got in sort of ransom and payola and booty from the Spaniards. And of course, the same was true of the Comanche on the northern frontier of the, the Spanish Empire. Both the Mapuche and the and the Comanche were imperial peoples themselves with their own empires, subjugating their own you know, native um, victims and subject uh, communities. And they constituted very formidable enemies whom the Spaniards uh, greatly respected and with whom they treated on, um, uh, on equal terms in, in, in negotiations between their respective uh, empires. And I think the key to success on these frontiers, which was admittedly, you know, intermittent success was never perfect, wasn't building fortifications. I mean, they did build fortifications, but they were of marginal use. And what, in the, I mean, in the book, we tell some extraordinary stories of how ill-equipped some of these fortresses were, you know, and it turns out, you know, that for long periods, they didn't have any muskets, or if they had the muskets, they didn't have any, any ammunition. But it wasn't the fortifications themselves that really made the difference. It was two things. In part, it was those missions. Now, in, in vast areas in Florida, in California, uh, in the Paraná Valley, these were vast frontier regions where it really wasn't practicable. There were no fortresses of any great significance. But the missions constituted the network of frontier um, defense, and they, they worked to a great extent to, you know, positive means of deterring um, invaders, or, or they absorbed the invasions and they fought the invaders um, off because the missions themselves were able to mobilize large amounts of indigenous manpower to defend the empire. So that's the first element. And the second element was alliances with indigenous peoples on the on the frontiers, and eventually, of course, when the late 18th century, in the case of the Mapuches, in the mid 18th century, in the case of the Comanche, the Spaniards turned these long-standing enemies into into allies, and to some extent into collaborators, and even in the case of the Mapuche, loyal um, subjects of the 
of the empire. And they, those negotiations were always extremely difficult, and sometimes in retrospect it seems a miracle that they were achieved at all, but they were absolutely critical in keeping the empire going. So fortifications are really important, I think, in a maritime sense, less so on the landward side, where missions and indigenous alliances were the really critical means of defending the empire. Hmm. So it's actually missions I'd like to ask about um, next. Religious orders were pretty heavily involved in all of this. And in fact, in the book, you speak about how the religious orders, in some senses, thought that well, really, the business of empire should be best left to them. Um, why did they think that? And to what extent did the state benefit from them being so involved? Well, missionaries typically um, were in competition with the secular authorities in two very obvious ways. One was for control of indigenous people and the you know the, the right to mobilize, deploy and in some sense exploit indigenous labor. Uh, so that was the, perhaps the first cause of friction between the missionaries and the secular authorities. And the second, and I think in many ways even bigger reason why these two vital parts of the Spanish Empire are often loggerheads with one another, is that missionaries thought uh, that they were pretty good at Christianizing uh, indigenous people. Indeed, they were. You know, I mean, their record is is pretty impressive one. It's not easy to change someone's world view and cosmic vision, but these uh, friars and Jesuits tend to be pretty good at that and they felt that their success was compromised and subverted by the uh, behaviour of secular Spaniards who mistreated indigenous people who failed to appreciate them uh, who set them a very bad <laughs> example of basically Christian um, behaviour and whom on the whole it was better to keep as far from the indigenous people as they could possibly be be kept and that is one of the reasons why some of these mission frontiers were handed over by the crown to the missionaries especially in Jesuit controlled areas to run without any secular Spaniards even being allowed to get near them uh, and to, I think to some extent that helps to account for their success. Well, I think, Miranda, about this point on Felipe, uh, the question of the Jesuits is, is key, is extremely interesting, um, because the Jesuits arrived late. And as they arrived late, the Spanish Empire was at that time very much based in cities, cities where the place of political governments, the elites, uh, people coming from very different continents or indigenous peoples coming from different places. And that's why at that moment, the frontiers was something between the cities, these big spaces, territories. Uh, in the case of South America, we're talking about all the frontiers of what is now Brazil, uh, from Uruguay to Venezuela. It's a huge amount of territory. And I think at that moment, you have this unique combination, Felipe. On the one hand, the Jesuits arriving late, just searching for their own space and, well, their own ideas about what's going to be uh, the experience of being a missionary. Very cosmopolitan experience, on the other hand, very unique in the case of the Jesuits. And at the same time, this, this question of how to define Miranda, who is going to take the responsibility of the frontiers and it worked very well between I'd say the 1550s and the moment of the uh, expulsion of the Jesuits in 1768 of the dominions of Charles III it was more or less almost two centuries of uh, presence in the frontiers building up a Jesuit utopia, and at the same time, well, I think it was very, very safe for the empires. They managed to organize these so-called private armies of indigenous peoples, and they they stopped 
de, de eh, tropas de rescate coming from Portugal, people just hunting slaves in what is now all the frontiers of, of Brazil. But that's a, it's a combination of uh, political crisis in the Spanish Empire, was, was, which was uh, at that time more or less arriving to the limits, and how these Jesuits were coming from very different and pragmatic ideas about how to organize the infrastructure of empire and how to defend the limit, I would say. Yeah, we tell a story of a, a, a Jesuit called Nicolás Mastrillo who arrives as a, a sort of rookie missionary in, in Andamarca, one of the highest and remotest Jesuit missions in the world in Peru in the 1590s. And he's this young man full of enthusiasm and writing a letter home to his, his the fellow Jesuits whom he'd left behind in, in Spain in his house of of study. And it's a very touching document because he describes how he, in the company of an older, more experienced missionary priest, goes off and crosses all these sort of mansions and jungles and undertakes this epic journey uh, to try and find unconverted uh, indigenous people to evangelize. And eventually, you know, they, they find some and they, they sit down with them, they attempt to, to communicate. And then uh, suddenly, you know, this, this rival band of indigenous people come along and they say, we don't believe that these guys are genuine Jesuits. We think they're Spaniards in disguise, which is an amazing thing because it shows you that these indigenous people thought the Spaniards, the secular Spaniards and the and the Jesuits must be you know, different races because they, they behaved so, so differently. And so eventually, you know, this moment of anxiety passes, everything is patched up. And the, 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 according to Nicolas Mastrigot's letter, the reason why the indigenous people decide they're going to, they're going to welcome these Jesuits is they say the, the, they were genuine, true fathers, that's the word they use, because they shared our food. And then they build, you know, this church out of palm leaves. It's the most extraordinary um, story, and I think it does take us to the the heart of the, the question, both the question of how the Jesuits had different standards from the secular Spaniards for relating to indigenous people, um, and also how... Uh, they penetrated these unpenetrated frontiers, extending the the reach of the Spanish um, monarchy. Uh, and finally, how they established you know, kind of protocols for mutual acceptance with the indigenous people amongst whom they worked. We've covered rather a lot of ground, um, literally and in terms of the book. But before I ask you each what you might be working on next, is there anything else about the book you want to make sure our listeners are aware of? Well, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Manolo here because we haven't talked, for example, about the 19th century part of the book that he wrote entirely on his own without any input from me. Well, I, I think it's just the element of how after the independence of Latin American countries at the beginning, well, throughout the um, imperial crisis and the civil wars two centuries ago, after now in 1824, it was the last battle, the Battle of Ayacucho in Peru. I think we, we, we try to offer something different about the action of engineers coming from civil cops and military engineers as well in Cuba and the Philippines. And what is interesting, I would say, Miranda, is how important innovations coming from the 19th century I mean, the telephone, the telegraph, the railways were first introduced in Cuba and then in the Philippines, then in, in Spain, in Europe. So I think it's a very interesting element just to take into account how modern was to be uh, the, the introduction of technology was in these in these territories uh, of this of Spain in the 19th century, and how well I think it's something very paradoxical we have to take into account. <laughs>
And I suppose one should also say that you, because we've we've been rather upbeat about our book, and I think we should say that quite a lot of it is about failures, sometimes sort of heroic failures, sometimes comic failures. But you know, there are places where the, the bridges just couldn't be built, and there are all these sort of stories, of marvelous stories of canals. As Spanish were very interested also in um, improving rivers as means of communication and creating um, canals. Most of the canal stories end in disaster. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they, they are quite um, uh, in a macabre and sort of horrific way. They can be quite amusing. I, I, I guess uh, uh, we, we, we should point out that we, we do have a lot of stories of failure in the book as well. Well, and I, I would add Felipe uh, Miranda, uh, this is a history of something unexpected. I was thinking about one of my favorite heroes of the book, who is a military engineer, very undisciplined, very lazy, somebody not respecting at all hierarchy and being at the same time uh, part of the Spanish army. And how he was punished to, he was sent to the Philippines as as he, suddenly he was in touch of almost everything there. Well, he had a, a wonderful and happy life. <laughs> Stuff absolutely unexpected. That sort of histories, I think, are key to explain the action of, well, Spanish and global engineering throughout the early modern era. Mm. Wonderful things to add in at the end of our conversation. Thank you both for that. I did say I had one final question, and I do. The book obviously has just come out, but given the publishing process, that means you had to finish it a bit of a time ago. Is there anything either of you are working on now that it's done that you'd like to preview or highlight, even if it's not working together or not on this topic? Well, I'm writing a history of primatology, subject I've always been interested in. I, I've tried to teach a course on it at the University of Notre Dame for many years now, and I, I feel I'm now ready to write the story of how our human species interacted with those on this planet that are most like us, that's to say other primates and especially other apes. Uh, and it's an important story for understanding ourselves as well as for understanding our relationship to the whole of nature and the whole of our evolutionary past. And it, I hope it's a it's a it's been a humbling experience for me to uh, you know, just uh, to, to to learn so much about primatology in the course of it, and to to learn how how wonderful. How how cognitively rich, how how uh, emotionally aware um, other non-human primates are, and how little really distinguishes us from them. But also to study you know, the subject, which is a very important theme in the history of science and hasn't been adequately studied. So I'm working on on that, and I'm also writing yet another history of the world because um, Old Street. Publishing and their wisdom have decided that there's scope for an even shorter history of the world than <laughs> I or anybody else has written before. So I'm also I'm also working on that. Over to Manuel. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm working now and researching a history of shipwrecks. I'm very interested in the question of how uh, well we have this idea a shipwreck was just happening happening in a moment in in one day one hour, but what, what is a surprise in this period is how shipwrecks can take a couple of weeks and you spend, you survive a couple of weeks uh, before losing your life. So I'm thinking about writing a book about this question, which, of course, I think it's very, very fascinating. Well, those are some very fascinating projects to be working <laughs> on. So thank you for the sneak preview. That's always a fun thing to end with. Um, and to just remind listeners that, of course, the book we've been discussing, we've done a highlights tour version of. There's so much more in the book itself, and you can read it. It's titled How the Spanish Empire Was Built, A 400-Year History, published by Reaction. Felipe and Manuel, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great treat.